Wow, they like you. I, I reckon. We'll see what after this <laughs> how they feel. This is everybody. This is my friend Michael Azarad. He edits a. Uh, he's the editor of a website I write for sometimes. Hi, how are you? I see familiar faces. Uh, he, I write for a website called thetalkhouse.com. It's musicians reviewing uh, music. And um, he wrote a great book called Our Band Could Be Your Life uh, about you know, music in the 80s, the so development of the punk scene, a lot of bands I listen to. If you haven't read his book, Our Band Could Be Your Life, check it out, it's awesome. And he's a great dude and he actually looks like an author. You know? <laughs> so I feel a little bit more distinguished up here with him. I, I feel pretty distinguished with you here, Randy, too. Because cool. I think you're a great author as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, I actually, I don't know, a couple years ago, I wrote a piece for Revolver, a profile of, uh, of Lamb of God. And I, w I walked around uh, Richmond with Randy. And we walked into a bookstore. And he, he, like, he knew all the books in the store. And the people who worked there knew him by name. And uh, he talked a lot about books, and I thought, I just kind of made a mental note of that. Like, wow, this, this guy's, he's a, hard, a nerd. hard rocker, but yeah, yeah, he's a, <laughs> I was going to say bookish. I wasn't going to say nerd. That's all right. Um, but uh, I thought, wow, this guy is, yeah, this guy is a book guy. And then uh, when the talk house started, I, I thought, I, you know, I was starting to think of musicians who could write, and I had never read anything that, that Randy wrote. But I knew, but I knew he could write because he th he thinks, you know, clearly thinks a lot about writing because he reads so much. So I invited him, and and the writing was really, really good. And then he told me that he was writing this book, and I got really excited because, like, wow, I knew that was going to be really good, and it turned out great. So. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, some of you have bought it. I really, I, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think the book was like excellent. It's really, really good. Uh, I hope you all buy it. It's like, it's a great read. Um, it is funny though because it's not, you know, it's written by a rock musician, but it's not a rock book, really, is it? No. Like, uh, I mean, I own lots of rock books, and. Uh, I mean, I hate to burst anyone's bubble, but Lamb of God just isn't that exciting of a band to be in. We just <laughs> aren't. And if you want to read about a band that's just crazy, no one's ever going to top like Motley Crue's The Dirt. And if you've ever, anyone here has ever read that, that, I mean, that makes the skin stand up on them. You know, you're just crawling like, oh my God can't believe these people did this and like for me to try and write a book about like we were hard partying and all that stuff you know it's ludicrous you know I, i'm not going to try and top that and plus the 80s are over anyway nobody has the money to get that messed up anymore so <laughs> <laughs> the music business doesn't support that but it's not really a rock book <laughs> but is there kind of like a rocker sensibility to either how you wrote it or how you got through this ordeal? Um, you know, uh, I, does everybody know this story? Pretty much. Y'all yeah. know I got locked up, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, what? What was required to get through that or ordeal? Uh, one thing I noticed, and I'll just preface this by saying, humor seems to be a big part of it. Huge. Um, and that kind of ties in, like, in, into the quote-unquote rocker sensibility, or, or the, I would go ahead and, you know, I don't really like categorizing, except for this one thing, the kind of punk rock sensibility, I'll go ahead and say it. Um, I don't, you know, I haven't throughout my adult life or my young life or currently now, uh, my old man life, I've never lived in like opulent splendor or anything. Uh, I've always lived very cheaply, very simply. I can get by without much. My expectations are low and uh, sometimes too low and things. So I think going to prison, um, and sitting in there, I was able to deal with things a little bit better than maybe someone who had never wanted for anything, you know? I didn't come from like, a, it's not like the jerk or anything, like a poor coal miner family or whatever. I didn't grow up like that, you know? I always had food to eat, but I, I didn't grow up in a rich family or anything. And I lived in a long series of punk houses that were, 
infested with lots of different vermin and you know body parasites and things like that and uh, when you lived in a house called Dirtbag Manor for a while willingly you actually pay rent there and everybody there is strung out on heroin or there's mountains of beer cans and all you can do is just sit there and laugh at how crappy your life is because well, I mean, you've made it that way, so you have no choice but to lie. That kind of like self-deprecating humor served me well in prison, you know, and through the whole ordeal. So yeah, so punk rock is a good preparation for imprisonment. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so buy your Sex Pistol records now, kids. <laughs> and you could withstand anything. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, uh, Mike Watt always talked about jamming Econo. Sounds like you jam mm -hmm. Econo. You live an economic. Life. Yeah, dude, we didn't like we didn't hatch out of a rock star egg, you know. We lived in like none of us had any money except for our drummer Chris, who somehow always had money. I hated him because of it. <laughs> I never liked him either. Yes. <laughs> um, what, so, what made you think that you could write a book? Like, wh how did you find it in yourself, and how did you start writing? Like, uh, what was the you know, it's so hard. To, it's easy to keep these things going, but it's so hard to start. And what, so what, what clicked in your mind that's, that told you, yes, I could do this, and how did you start doing it? Right. Well, the thing is, is that I, I've always, I've been reading since I was a young kid, you know. Um, like, I'd, it, it, I remember at one point, I guess it was like the second grade, our, our television exploded because there was some sort of lightning storm, and we had bad power in the house, and it exploded in my face and we didn't get another television for years up until like eighth or ninth grade so I just read you know um, so in that process I always started thinking I want to write a book I want to write a book one day and then I started learning about writers and I am an American male and I'm an American male who like to party and so I started reading Guess Bukowski, Hemingway Hunter S. Thompson, all these macho dudes who did a lot of drugs and like chased women and got in fights and drank hard and wrote hard these like manly books. So I did a lot of drugs and I drank really hard and I chased women and I got in a lot of fights and I did everything the great writers did except for write. <laughs> you know? So I had the lifestyle mastered. I put in the time there, you know, and somehow I clowned my way into a band at that time, you know. Um, but I, I always felt that I could do it, you know. I just, I don't know, I read so much, and then I've read some bad books where I'm like, I can do better than this. I can do better than this. Why is this published, you know? Um, so, and I'm not saying I'm the new Hemingway or Tolstoy or anything, you know, I'm just saying I'm, I could write better than some of the stuff I'd read, you know. Um, and, and when I got, finally stopped drinking, you know, uh, I, and I actually started writing some pieces for you know, the talk house and doing some other stuff, writing a little bit more long form. Um, I was thinking, you know, it's, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. And I didn't know what it was going to be about. And then uh, this unfortunate situation arose. And uh, I, as I was going through the whole thing, I was keeping a journal and I was thinking, man, this will probably make a pretty crazy book one day. You know, but that's like one day when I'm old and wiser and, you know, I'm wearing robes and looking like, you know, I'm resting on my laurels and then I can write my memoirs or whatever. As soon as I was found, like, not guilty, not, not too long after, our booking agent, this guy Tim Bohr, starts leaving me messages and he's like, I know a literary agent who wants to talk to you. And um, being somewhat familiar with the way the book world works you know there's guys who would kill to get a literary agent you know but I was like I don't want to talk to this guy because I know he's gonna want me to write about the whole prog thing that's the only reason why a literary agent is going to be calling me right now you know um, so I blew my friend off as long as I could and then I got guilty feelings because he's a good dude and I'm like he's like just talk to this guy so I talked to um, this gentleman uh, Mark Gerald who's now my agent who's here somewhere in here um, and I gave him my whole spiel I'm like look 
I think this book could help some people. I think there's some value in my experience. I think I can write it well. Um, and I think it's a compelling story, but I'm just not ready. You know, I just got done with this stuff. I want to forget about it. I have this journal. I have these really strong memories. And he's just like, I'll never forget. We're talking on the phone. He said, yeah, Randy, but the memories are going to fade. And I'm like, you're right. You're right. And it was such a weird, bizarre place to be in that I wanted to capture it, capture it while the memories were as fresh as possible. Because in the book, I want the person to feel like they're there with me. You know, that's important to me. And I think the best books do that. They take you outside of where you are, you know. And that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to take, I wanted to take you to prison with me as, <laughs> as the best I could <laughs> without you having to actually go. So that's how, like, I was convinced to write it. I didn't want to write it at first. I wanted to write it eventually, but in some far nebulous future time. Right. <laughs> when you're an old guy, you're sitting in your easy chair with a cat curled up in your lap yeah. in the fireplace and, and all the that. pipe and all that stuff you know and the big Lebowski robe <laughs> yeah, all that stuff um, so uh, where in the story did you just start writing from the beginning or did you kind of start in the middle or the no end, I or? start from the beginning wow. uh, because like it <clears throat> in a way uh, you know because I wrote a rough draft to a novel before any of this stuff happened before I went to jail. I, I did it as an exercise. Um, anybody who writes has probably heard of this thing, NaNoWriMo, where you try and write a 50,000 word novel in, uh, in one month. And they do it in November. And um, I was always on tour in November, so I decided to do it by myself in like January or something. So I wrote this, this fictional story, and it's terrible. You know, there's holes in it. It's just maybe there's a some sort of idea left in there somewhere um but it was a good it let me know that i could get words on paper you know um so in some ways the, the writing this this book uh, dark days was a lot easier than writing the fiction stuff because the structure is already there basically i know the beginning and i, I always heard you know if you're going to write a book you want the beginning to be compelling you know you want people you don't want to take eight pages to get into like something that interests people so in the first page of the book it's like I'm being handcuffed bloom you know I mean that's already you want to know like why is this guy being handcuffed what's it's going on and then the end is obviously me not being handcuffed um, so Spoiler I knew, alert. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I knew that I just had to get from A to B, and I kind of, you know, I knew what happened. I knew the whole process. So in a way, the structure was provided to me, and that makes it easier than fiction. But at the same time, it made it more difficult because I couldn't deviate to make things more interesting. I tried to be very, very honest in the book. I didn't embellish. You know, it was weird enough as it was. And also, I could not only just deviate to make things more interesting, <clears throat> a lot of crappy stuff happens in that book. And I couldn't, like, suddenly to develop the ability to fly out of the story or something. I don't like this, you know, and I'm, I'm going to get in my car and drive away. I had to, to stay with the story. So, I mean, the structure of the book was kind of provided by the tragic events that, uh, that precipitated it. Right. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I've started books in the middle, and, you know, they've kind of grown out, you know, from there. But, right. um, you know, the, you were talking about bringing the, the reader, you know, into your prison world. Uh, you know, you do that with, uh, and one does that with details. Right. There are so many incredible, you know, funny, frightening, uh, insightful details in this book. And, uh, and, you know, you know, you have a great sense of the telling detail. You know, you, you don't often give us details that don't tell us something. And that's one of the reasons you're a really good writer. Um, but how did you, tell us about how you preserved all those details. Um, and uh, I, I gather you kept a journal. Why, like, why did you keep a journal in prison? Well, uh, like when I got arrested, they took everything I had in my pockets, and I had a, you know, a moleskin with a, a pen with me, <coughs> and um, 
they, I did three days in jail. I didn't have anything. And then finally they moved me to this prison and I still didn't have anything. And after about three days in the prison, they gave me most of what I had in my pockets, including my journal and a pen. And at first it was like, I immediately sat down and wrote down every single thing I could remember from the second I was arrested up until then. And that <laughs> was primarily an act of uh, self-preservation because I thought it might come in handy during a court case later. Like I need to remember every single thing that's going on. I wasn't there for a speeding ticket, you know. Um, and I needed to, and I thought maybe the act of writing could help recall details, you know. Um, <clears throat> eventually, you know, keeping a journal, I wasn't writing the journal. I'm not a disciplined journal dude outside of prison. In prison, I'm really good at it because there's nothing else to do. Outside of prison, I'll like write for three or four days, you know, and then I'll get distracted and go to Starbucks or something. Um, <coughs> in prison, there wasn't much else to do but write, you know, and read. And, uh, you know, I thought maybe it would be good to keep a record of, of what I was doing for my court case in case I got out, in case anything weird happened in prison. And then, you know, on kind of a morbid note, um, I thought if I died in prison, you know, if something happened to me, my family might want to know what I was how I was then, you know. So uh, it's, a, it's a little record of, of, you know, the things that happened and, and kind of also my m emotional state at that time. Uh, I, I would, I mean, that was, you know, obviously a traumatic experience. I mean, I remember hearing about it and I, I was scared and I, I like I didn't even know you that well at that point but I was I was scared like hearing about what happened and just you know and you even say in the book it's, it's very Kafkaesque um, but going through all these notes and writing the book was it you know were, were these triggers was it traumatic to relive this or was it therapeutic or maybe a little both like I mean it, I don't know it must have been really traumatic intense. yeah it sucked yeah like um, and I think, you know, I think maybe um, a lot of people have asked me if this was therapeutic, if this helped me come to terms with everything that happened <clears throat> and like help me process it, all that stuff. Um, no, like it didn't. We, I, I got found not guilty and Lamb of God immediately went on tour because uh, we had to make some money and I know there has to be a one person here who like donated five dollars to the legal defense scene. Someone did. Who, thank you. Uh, you know the fans carried us through, but we were pretty broke. We got done, so I was still constantly mentally living in what I've been gone through. And we went on tour for a while, you know. And it's not like I had this like break away from my life, you know, away, away from what happened. I lived in it. Um, so when I wrote the book, um, it did help me mentally really chronologically sort things, but it wasn't like these new feelings arose or anything. It was a bummer. And it was also, it did make me, I, I will admit, I was proud of myself a little bit, sometimes reading this stuff in this journal. And I was like, you know, <clears throat> you did all right in a, in a pretty bad spot. You know, you handled yourself all right. I didn't do it perfectly. I, you know, I'm not some hard ass or something, but I didn't freak out, you know. And uh, I tried my best to do the right thing. And, I, and, and that comes across when I read the journal to myself, you know. And so it wasn't, it, it's not fun to read. You know, it's not like something, in, oh, let's reminisce about the prison month, you know. It's, it's a good time. <laughs> Let's, let's think about the food there. It was awesome. It's not like that. Yeah. Uh, that there's a little passage about cheese that is just about as traumatic as anything I think of that entire book. <laughs> yes, it's it was traumatic, traumatic cheese, <laughs> <laughs> immoral cheese, <laughs> immorally horrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But wow, I didn't know about touring right after you got out. What what incredible, crazy whiplash. You go from being in a the bowels of a Czech prison to uh, the lavish life of a rock star. I was... Uh, when I got out on bail, I was on stage nine days later in Iowa in front of... Yeah, I don't know, 15, 20,000 people and not fest. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's really it's like, hey, you know, that was kind of intense. And I mean, we had to make some money. And I also, I also did that to get back on stage immediately. And it was the last thing I wanted to do, to tell you the truth. But I got that, I, I did that to get back on stage to let people know, you know, this stuff didn't break me. I'm here. You know, I'm I'm here. I'm going to carry on with my life the best I can. Um, you know, I I, I, mean, I I read I read the book as a. It's very inspiring. You know that um, someone can go through something like that, uh, and come out with your sanity, you know, intact, and your you seem to still love life as much as you did before that. And um, but uh, I'm wondering, you know, what you hope people get out of this book. I think, you know, one thing that really, like, at first I would get really disappointed when, you know, I would talk about this and what happened. And, and after the end of it, you know, and everybody knew what happened, I went back and faced trial and people would be like, I never would have done that. I never would have done that. And I was like, that's a bummer, man. Because to me, <clears throat> it seemed like the ethical thing to do. And so I started getting twisted in my head and being like a little little pedantic, little moralistic, little high and mighty. And then I realized, you know, that's also a bunch of bullshit. Um, like, people don't know how they would have reacted in that situation. You don't know what you're going to do in a situation until you're in that situation. You know? You just don't know. And it's... I can't sit here and say, I would do this. I wouldn't do that if I was, you know, in that situation. Because I don't know, you know. I think people sell themselves short. Um, and if anything, anybody can take anything out of this book away from it, is that being afraid is not a sign of cowardice. You know what I mean? Because I was scared shitless, man. I was terrified during all this stuff. I wasn't like some hard-ass dude like, yeah, I'm going to go face prison or whatever, you know? Screw that. You know, if you know, you ever spend the night in the drunk tank, you know, you don't want to go back to being locked up. But it's okay to be afraid, but it's also okay to do the right thing even when it's scary. That's the main like sort of point I'm trying to illustrate with it, you know, not in a preachy like moralizing way, but just like, you know, I was scared, but I felt an imperative to go back and try and provide some answers and figure out some answers to this situation because I didn't know exactly what was going on, you know. Um, and the, you know, the family of this young man who died, they never once attacked me in the press. They never attacked me in person. They never came at me through any sort of legal channel or otherwise. Um, they were incredibly gracious. They just wanted some answers to know what happened to their son. Their son was dead. And if I don't, I felt if I didn't like do my best to like try and provide them with these answers, then I, I'm not much of a man in, in my eyes. I'm not like taking responsibility for what I might need, in fact, I might need to be held accountable for some actions. I wasn't sure. Maybe someone during the trial would come up with some sort of evidence. It's like, dude, you did this. You know, here it is. Uh, I was 99% sure in my mind I never intended to harm someone. But what if? What if someone, you know, came up with that? I mean, they're charging me for a reason, I suppose. So to me, it felt. You know, if I hadn't have gone back to trial, man, I would have just, I wouldn't have been able to look at myself in the mirror. I'd probably start drinking again, and, you know, next thing you know, I'd be a dead man. And so I was very scared, dude, very scared during this whole time, but I still followed what my internal compass told me was true north, what's the right way to go. And if anyone takes anything away from that book, in a general sense, it's that it's okay to do the right thing even when you're scared.
Um, and it's it's interesting because the only way that you can really convey that message is to write very extensively about that whole experience. You can't just sort of come out and say, like, you should be personally responsible. You actually have to tell this story in, in you know, brutal detail and have people feel what you had gone through step by step so they can understand the impact of what you did. That, that's one of the great things about the book. It's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's harrowing and it's funny and it's well written and all that stuff, but it's, that's, it's all in there for a reason. It's kind of leading up to this idea. And that said though, not everyone has a sense of personal responsibility. I'm really curious about where do you think that, that came from. I, I know your, your father's a man of God. Yeah, but is it, is it that part of it. Or, or he's a minister. Rock? I mean, like growing up, I love my father very much. He's a liberal minister, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a uh, very intelligent man. But him and my mother instilled in me a strong sense of what's right and wrong, and it, not in the beating you over the head with the Bible type, like you got to do this or you're going to hell, you know. But just like this is right and this is wrong, and I was. Always, since a young age, I, I was held uh, accountable for my actions. Probably, my the old man was a little bit strict. Just, he's kind of a hard ass on me, so I probably was held a little bit more accountable than other people, maybe. Um, not much got written off as youthful indiscretion in the Bly household, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, and, and the old man used to piss me off. I'm like, oh! Oh, welcome to the 20th century because you know he still thought it was beaver cleaver time in the 50s or whatever you know but he was trying to teach me to be a man he was trying to me to, the best he could to teach me to be responsible for myself and and also man as a as a musician as an artist we have a decent sized fan base i do all these I do all these songs, man, and I'm talking about injustice and, and about abuses of power and people who don't, you know, like consider other people and how their actions affect them. You know, I'm yelling all this stuff from this stage, from this intense point of like dramatic, almost power, you know? And then it comes down to like, okay, I have to be held accountable for my actions. Like, okay, I gotta put my money where my mouth is or else I'll have no credibility whatsoever. Am I gonna, you know, am I gonna talk the talk or am I gonna walk the walk? Yep, well, you walked the walk and, um, and you wrote the book. <laughs> it is. And it's really, really good. Um, so we are going to open up the floor to uh, questions from the audience. Got one down here. Hi, um, so, sorry, talk the sound guy. <laughs> so, um, you know, as a metal musician, you always see concerts going crazy. You see walls of death, you know, kids punching mm -hmm. each other, kicking, and stage dives and all that. Um, in, a, in a million years, did you ever think that you would be charged with something like this? Like, <clears throat> no. Um, like, because... Like the whole wall of death thing, first of all, we didn't start that. That comes from right here in New York City, from the hardcore scene, shout out to Sick of It All, you know, and Madball and all those dudes, I know those guys. They, they started that, that's their thing. And it went away for a while, and um, me and the singer of the band, Chimera, were talking about it, and we started doing it again. And then I did it on Ozfest, 2004 and it got on video and then like it just blew up we like I almost I kind of feel bad about bringing it back that big because it went out of this like little underground thing that would happen at CBGB or or even like you know Roseland or whatever and to like to do that at Ozfest we were doing that at Ozfest <coughs> And we did it for like the first four shows in 2004 and Sharon Osborne's insurance company came to her and it's like, what are these Lamb of God dudes doing? Because nobody had ever seen that before. They're like, you have to stop them. Someone is going to die. Because we used to organize it and, you know, we stopped doing that and the kids still do it. Um, and we worry about that stuff, you know. And we've stopped shows before where people are just being dicks. You know, and nobody's helping anybody because that's not the community I grew up in. You know, I used to go to the hardcore show and 
<clears throat> unless you have beef with someone, and then of course that happens. I mean, people are there to have a good time together, not kill each other. So, but we worry about the audience, you know, especially as we get bigger, and we have gotten bigger over the years, and the audience have gotten more and more like Slayer esque. You know what I mean? Like, ah, and you're like, whoa, you know. Whoa, I mean, you ever seen 10,000 people run at each other? You're like, I did that, it's crazy, you know? So, you know, it, it, yeah, I worry, but I, man, we always had precautions in place to prevent this stuff, and like kids getting on stage, I, I wanna say, you know, I grew up in small shows, the hardcore scene, I jumped on stage, I did stage diving, all that stuff. The reality is, that was a different time, and that was a much smaller community. A big show, when I was a kid, was three to 500 people. It wasn't four to 5,000 people. It wasn't 10,000 people. There weren't shows back in the day like there are now. They didn't exist. So, I mean, you get that many pieces of the machine moving and moving violently. Sooner or later, something's gonna malfunction. Someone's gonna get hurt, and people have gotten hurt, you know? So yeah, it, it scares me. Um, but I never, that's why we, you know, have in our contract security. Regrettably, this one night, this club, they didn't fulfill their contractual obligations. I should have walked off the stage, but I didn't. And, you know, the result of what happened is in the book, you know, that, that's, it's sad. You know, that's a lesson learned. But yes, I, I worry. I worry about the people. And no, I never thought it would get to this point. But I think what happened to me was inevitable. It's going to happen to somebody. I just caught a bullet. So. Yeah, one of the best. <coughs> Be careful, people. Be carefully. Fuck. That's that's Seriously. Um... I fucking love you, man. <laughs> I fucking love Lamb of God. I love metal. Uh, never thought I'd be talking to you. Uh, just, a, just a question I had was... In a bookstore. In a bookstore. In a in, bookstore, nonetheless. In, in the rare books room. The rare bookstore. Um, my, my question is, you talked about how the fans helped, when, when you were in prison, the fans helped putting, putting you through and uh, someone put money in a, in a legal fund. Mm -hmm. uh, my question was, uh, how did other metal bands react to that? Did they help? Uh, like, how did the community of bands help? I mean, we don't have, like, a across-the-board metal scene accountant who, like, breaks down who gives what. You know, that's not the way it is. Um, but a lot of people in the metal scene spoke up. Um, you know, my friend Jamie Josta, he sings for a band called Hatebreed. He runs a, a clothing line called Hatewear. He made free Randy shirts. He sold them, he donated the proceeds. Different fans made them themselves, sold them, uh, donated the proceeds. We had an auction of stuff that we had that we, over the years, you know, fans bought that, you know. Um, like, a lot of bands, like, spoke up, you know. Just raise awareness because, <coughs> I mean, I, I'm not saying it's like a con conspiracy, like the government hates metal or something, but, you know, like, if this had happened to <laughs> Kesha or someone, you know, like the Navy SEALs would have been flown in, you know. Like, for me, they're like, oh, it's like some dirty, you know, metal dude from Virginia. Like, there wasn't m that much attention drawn to the situation. Um, so uh, the community, we, you know, we, we, the community came together to take care of me in a, in a great way, and I'm forever grateful for it. You know what I actually think is interesting is that the, the, the metal community, well, there was Sharon Osbourne, right, weighed in, yeah. but, but the, the metal community was all around you, even imprisoned, because they were metal fans who were prisoners, and there were even metal fans who were guards. You yeah. talk about this guard who was into... Uh, Rammstein and stuff like yeah. you know, there were a few guards who were actually into metal and so the, this metal community sort of infiltrated like kind of all through your whole s story here yeah dude when they can, is my microphone still working there check so uh, like hey like when they 
took my cell phone, right? Uh, when they took it away, they were like, we're going to read your SIM card now. And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, don't do that. And I, I was kind of like, like, I wasn't like worried about them, like, uh, giving my numbers away or whatever. I actually thought in my mind, right? I was like, I hope there's no like metalhead guys who work in the office of the police station who read this SIM card. Cause they're gonna be like, okay, check. I'm gonna call Slash. I'm gonna call Ozzy. <laughs> He's got Corey Taylor's number over here. <laughs> He's gonna call the, oh, James Hetfield, Lars. I'm gonna tell him I hated the last record. I'm gonna call this guy. <laughs> I'm gonna do this. And I, I was like, man, if someone got in there and they were like a metalhead, it'd just be a nightmare because we are everywhere, you know? Um, and there was a guard who was in the prison who came and he brought me cigarettes. He's like, I saw you at Rockin' Park with Vinnie Paul watching Alice in Chains. He's like, just go home, Randy. And I'm like, I'm trying, dude, I'm trying. <laughs> but he brought me some cigarettes and I gave him like a, a Willie Adler guitar pick because I, I had six of them when I was arrested in my pocket. <laughs> they, I traded them for smokes and stuff. Well, that's the currency. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. great. But, and there were other like prisoners. And that was kind of disturbing at first because I wanted to be really anonymous when I went to prison. And that was a foolish idea because my face is everywhere. <laughs> But like all over the papers when I walked in and I'm the first day I'm in the prison I see this guy and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like all right there, there there goes that you know but maybe when you're in prison you want to use anything you've got to your advantage and maybe being a singer in a metal band was an advantage somehow I th in, in a way it was uh, in a way it could have been a very big disadvantage being a public person because they didn't put me in like the the what is that chick that keeps on going to rehab or what Paris uh, Paris Hilton or don't, don't they keep locking her up or something <laughs> Lindsay oh yeah whatever one of those chicks like like didn't she like get locked away in a special wing or something they don't like put her right in with the with, jacuzzi and stuff yeah yeah, all that stuff. It wasn't like that for me. No. You know? Uh, like, they didn't put me in, like, the celebrity wing because there wasn't one, you know? Yeah. Um, so, like, I think m in my case, it was good because, like, everybody in there, everyone in the prison knew who I was. Everyone. When you are sitting there... I don't know if anyone here has ever done any drugs, right? Not but, no, no one here. <laughs> Not now. Don't do them now. But have you ever done any like any sort of substances and you think everybody's looking at me, you know? And like, but it's just your paranoia. When I walked into population the first day, I was like, everybody's looking at me, and it was real, you know. You don't know what it's like to walk through like a long line of a hundred prisoners, and they're like. Like, that's that dude, you know? That's him. He's the guy in the newspaper. That's him. He's here for killing a citizen. Luckily, I think they all, like, read the thing, and they're like, dude, this was some sort of accident, you know? And they're trying, the government might be trying to screw you for money right now. Not the family of the young man, but the government, you know? Um, so, like, but... You know, if it had been different circumstances, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know, man. It could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. I would have rather just been way under the radar, but that's not what happened. I got one more at the back. Hola. I fucking love you too, man. How about you? There's a lot of man love happening here. And, and, like, my question to you is, you used to suffer from, like, heavy drinking when did you realize that you need to stop drinking and how did you deal with being away from alcohol? How did I deal with being away from alcohol? I got sober and I wrote about the last day. I wrote about the last drunk I ever went on in the book. And uh, I wrote about my alcoholism. I wrote about it very honestly. Um, you know, I got... I got a message from my mom yesterday. She's like, I'm buying your book. Is there anything I need to know before I read it? <laughs> I'm like, really? Like, I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm like, no, nothing that you should be that like shocked about. I'm not like coming out of the closet or like, you know, saying that I have a multiple personality or nothing weird, you know, I, you know, I'm not like, I'm not sh saying anything you don't already know, but like, I'm very honest with my alcoholism about that, 
you know. Uh, and that's the other big thing. If The whole chapter I wrote about alcoholism, it wasn't for people who can drink normally. When you, when you guys read this, it kind of explains it, but that, I wrote that for people who can't drink normally, you know, so that they can see that y you can stop drinking. And I wrote about the last night I ever drank. And I wrote about the next day. And the, that's in one of the latter chapters, my last drunk, and it was in Australia. And I woke up, I was in Australia, I was on tour with the biggest metal band in the world. And, you know, we all know who that is. Uh, and I'm in Australia, which is like paradise. And it's a beautiful, beautiful day. And I'm in Brisbane, down the street from the Brisbane Botanical Gardens. And it's just like, they have weird animals and beautiful flowers that you want to go and walk through. And it's just a cool place. And I woke up one morning and hung over and I was just like, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do, I don't want to drink, I don't want to not drink, I don't want to be a musician, I don't want to read a book, I don't want to sleep, I don't want to eat, I don't want to talk, I don't want to breathe, I don't want to do anything. I was completely empty. And in front of me there's like all the drinks from last night and I was like, man I gotta try something different, you know. So. Um, that was <coughs> in 2010, and um, you know, I, I, my first day sober was a little bit different than most n normal people. I was really hungover, and then I walked on stage in front of 15,000 people, <laughs> like crying, you know, but trying to look metal at the same time with my hair down. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> are you ready to rock? <laughs> you know, it was messed up, you know, but. Um, it was just this moment that, like, all I had become was, like, a receptacle for alcohol. I had no control over my life anymore, you know? And I wasn't enjoying it anymore. It was making me desperately unhappy. And there were some other people on that tour who had quit drinking, and they watched over me and helped me out a lot, you know? So if someone's struggling, man, with drugs or drinking, um, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to get sober. There's all sorts of different ways to get help. For me, I had to get some help. I didn't go to rehab, but I did hang out around a lot of people who don't drink anymore, and they taught me what they do, you know? And I wouldn't recommend trying it by yourself. If you're, if you're that tough, congratulations. I wasn't. I'm a big wuss. You know, I just, you know. And now, dude, like, people are, like, on tour. Like, is it hard for you being on tour, like, around people drinking and all that stuff? And I'm, like, they're, like, doesn't it make you want to drink? And I'm, like, no, because they're fucking idiots, you know. <laughs> I look at them, and I'm, like, oh, my God, I hate you, and I used to be far worse than you. So it just makes me not want to drink more. We're unfortunately out of time for the conversation portion of the evening. On behalf of Strand, thank you so much, Randy and Michael, for joining us. Let's give them a hand. Thank you guys for coming out.